So next we head about 6,000 kilometers east-southeast from Qatar, Qatar to Malaysia, and their 2018 champion, Kyria Mohamed Hanafia, or Kai for short, a lecturer at Malaysia's University of Science. Now, many have varied are the reasons why people say they entered Fame Lab, but Kai's is one of the favorites I've ever heard. She says she decided to enter after, quotes, observing her husband's eyes glaze over whenever she tried to philosophize the humanity of the adaptive immune response. <laughs> exactly the same thing happens with me. Now, Kai's reasons for wanting to improve at communicating science aren't just limited to entertaining her husband. She says that she hopes her efforts, and again, quotes, will ensure that her sons grow up knowing that cleavage isn't just a gap between bosoms. Great image. So now she's got her family and FameLab Malaysia sorted. She's come here to Cheltenham to sort us too. So prepare to be bosom buddies with our amazing Malaysian champion, Kai Mohamed Hanafia. <laughs> If you had to choose to fall into the arms of someone in this crowd, wouldn't you rather fall into the familiar arms of a friend? Well, that's how antibodies choose the antigens that they want to bind to, to be locked in a molecular embrace. In fact, antibodies can only bind antigens, which are pieces of bacteria or virus, that they've met before that they recognize as familiar. It is this familiarity and exclusive match that forms the basis of many of our innovations in biomedical research. Particularly for my research, the specific recognition of antibody to antigen can be used as biomarkers and turned into simple diagnostic tests, like a pregnancy test, but to diagnose an infectious disease. Now, Usually, antibodies recognize antigens better than you would recognize the face of a loved one in a room full of strangers. But a problem arises when sometimes antibodies mistakenly recognize a similar but different antigen, the way I might mistakenly recognize Brad Pitt as my husband when I'm not wearing my glasses. <laughs> now, this is a common problem in developing an antibody-based test, but especially to diagnose TB, a disease that, af that afflicted 10.4 million people just in 2016. This is partly because the bacteria that causes TB, the Mycobacterium tuberculosis, has many mycobacterial cousins that our bodies constantly meet in the environment. This confuses an antibody-based test and gives rise to false positive results, which reduces its accuracy. That's why, even until today, we are stuck with methods to diagnose TB that are time-consuming, expensive, and laborious. And most importantly, they will miss the majority of people living, in t living with TB in areas without lab facilities, depriving them of a cure. That's why my research is investigating different mycobacterial antigens and how our antibodies recognize them. Hopefully, one day we can discover an antibody-antigen match that can be turned into a simple diagnostic test to diagnose TB in big hospitals as well in remote villages without running electricity. Such a discovery could be the difference between containment and spread or life and death. Such a discovery could be an antibody antigen match made in heaven. Thank you very much. Is this the same reason that lies behind uh, the vaccines for TB not being nearly as effective in some countries as they are in others? That's a great question. It's not exactly the reason why the vaccines don't work. The long perception has been that antibodies in TB are essentially useless. But the real reason why a lot of the vaccines don't work in adults is because 
the way that we make a response against the, the actual TB uh, bacteria as well is very slow. So even when you vaccinate, it does not mount a quick enough response. So it's not so much whether or not it's a good or strong response, it just doesn't come soon enough. But linked to antibodies, one of the reasons why we are struggling with vaccines for TB as well is we don't know what are the correlates of protection. We know antibodies don't mean the person's protected. So it's very difficult to actually measure what gives protection against TB when we're trying to find new vaccines. Thank you. Clifford. I was just wondering um, if uh, uh, you mentioned the various um, uh, sort of cousins of, uh, of, of, of TB that we encounter quite regularly. Yeah. What are the sources of those? Where are those found? Um, they're everywhere. They're, the term is they're ubiquitously found. Uh, the other term for them is environmental mycobacteria or non tuberculous mycobacteria, mainly because one, um, you can't get them from another person. So you, if you are infected by them, they can cause disease if you're immunocompromised. So if you get, get them, then it means you've gotten them from the environment. But they don't cause the tuberculous type of disease that mycobacterium tuberculosis does. Um, and they're quite varied in their sources. There are different species that prefer certain places. For example, um, there was a, ref a report uh, a few years ago, actually, about women in a menopausal age getting these lung infections. And it, they discovered that it was because there was mycobacterium avium in the water supply that they were drinking. And usually it wouldn't make probably you and I are sick, but there were certain people that were actually getting sick from it being in the water system. So water system, very common to get mycobacteria, soil. Um, we've done some studies in Malaysia. It's in the paddy fields. It's um, in the waste sites. Um, it's everywhere. Thank you. Okay, antibodies not from anybody, but from our Qatar champion, Kai Anapa Atiyah.